फोर थ्री टू वन वी आर लाइव warm welcome to the active learning sessions for pediatric orthopedic fellows we have uh, another expert this time and that is jim mccarthy he is from cincinnati children hospital and his main area of interest is cerebral palsy deformity correction and gait analysis today we are going to discuss something about the topic which he has made a very popular uh, in the pediatric orthopedic and that's about uh, delphi survey so why we need a delphi survey that is going to tell us in the beginning and after that we will have a interaction about how to have a safe hamstring lengthening surgery we are very fortunate to have dr abhay gahukamble uh, who is from uh, christian medical college bellore but at present he is in sydney and for him it's 2 am in the morning and we are very thankful to abhay for joining us so both the jim and abhay thank you very much for accepting our request and uh, coming to this session and teaching something a practical thing from your vast experience so uh, dr mccarthy now you can start your presentation and then we will have our interaction or the case discussion that sounds great okay let me know if you uh, when you can see this screen all right can you see my screen excellent yes Uh, so I'm going to introduce the Delphi process and you know our thought process behind it, and then after that we can certainly ask as many questions um, as makes sense from your standpoint to better understand this. And this is really something I didn't know anything about before I got started um, with this with this program. So let me kind of give you a little background on why well, we elected to move where we did. Um, there are really no financial disclosures for me. I, I would, before we start, like to thank all the experts that I invited to be part of this, um, and they're listed here from around the world. I'm sure you know many of those names. But really, the the problem that I identified clinically was that one, we know we can improve function if we do surgery well, in especially with ambulatory children with cerebral palsy, and that the functional benefits are identified. They're relatively clear and they are maintained over time and there's now pretty good evidence for that and we also have a really uh, um, good way to assess uh, ambulatory conditions in in a uniform fashion especially if you do have access to motion analysis or some form of capture but what we can't agree upon is actually what to do with that data and so i had a patient that went to several great institutions that i highly respect and also came to our institution with the same motion analysis the same data and they had three different prescriptions for surgery and it was difficult for them and confusing for them as well as me and so the hope was maybe there's something we can do to get better alignment with this uh, topic and it's been something that we've been trying to do in cerebral palsy for a long time but because of the complexity of the patients and the high number of procedures it's very difficult uh, to study this from a clinical or using evidence-based research. So this is just an example of a child who's walking with a crouch and I won't go into a lot of detail. So this, this is similar to the patient that I saw. And when they came through, there were a list of different things that could be done. And typically I'll ask people, which one of these different procedures would you do? And quite honestly, the, the re- results are across the board as far as what people will do. There's a, a really a wide variation. And um, I'll just, we can just show before and after. So this is a patient we actually did guided growth and extension casting, so fairly minimal surgery. Uh, they weren't able to have a great deal of therapy as well. So that's why we chose that route, but here's how they're doing. Um, but there are a lot of different ways. And I think many of those ways probably would have gotten good results. But the Delphi technique we chose because we have this highly complex population with dozens of procedures and multiple variations. And it's really impossible to study using traditional techniques because it's hard to get the exact question um, because the patients vary so much. And then there's so many different iterations of surgery. So we thought we would start with consensus and Delphi is an iterative process to gain consensus among experts. In other words, um, we wanted to find practical steps towards understanding and defining current orthopedic surgical practice variation for the treatment of children with cerebral palsy. 
we call it Mission Impossible because we've really been trying to do this for a long time. And um, we thought if we could accomplish this it, and do it in a relatively short time, that, that would be a wonderful accomplishment. Uh, also because of the movie and also because Audrey Hepburn, who um, if many of you know, um, was a wonderful spokesperson for UNICEF. And she said, nothing is impossible. Even the word itself says I'm possible. So the goal is to provide a list of consensus indications and contraindications for the most common procedures performed in ambulatory children with cerebral palsy from a group of international experts and use this data as a foundation from which to identify areas that require further investigation. So areas of equipoise that we can study more clearly um, using more traditional research methods. Uh, personally, I was a little bit selfish too because I, I know you had Friedman Miller on, but there are a number of really smart people that have dedicated themselves uh, to the treatment of children with cerebral palsy and they're getting towards retirement age. And I wanted to try to capture their knowledge as best I could. I certainly believe it's important to listen to elders advice, not because they're always right, but because they've experienced a lot of experience of being wrong and, and understanding what works and what doesn't work and trying to gather their wisdom so I don't have to make those same mistakes again. So the overreaching goals were to create a reservoir of expertise, to shorten the learning curve for a very complex condition, to prevent unneeded surgeries and decrease harm, and in some ways to get me up to speed and practice at the same level of some of these great icons in, in uh, surgery. The modified Delphi technique really is not a polar survey. It's, some people call it that. It's really uh, a method and it has very specific steps. It was developed in the 1950s when they wanted to try to determine what kind of tactical weapons could be useful. And since you can't try those out because it would require the death of millions, they would, um, they would survey experts in a very uniform method. And uh, I don't know if it's used for that anymore, but it's now used commonly uh, in medicine um, and in various other branches of science. And essentially it has a number of steps. The first is to identify expert panel formation and that expert panel formation needs to remain intact throughout the Delphi process. Um, for us, we had a collate and agree upon the most common procedures. There's 40 or 50 procedures being performed. We had to create and agree to a format to classify the indications because indications sort of come in different flavors. And then once you do that, you begin these multiple rounds of consensus process on those most common procedures. So in many ways, we had to simplify the surgical process by procedure and it starts with open-end questions and that gets collated, that goes to a survey. And I'll go into a little more detail on how that might look. And then once you have that, you want to summarize and disseminate the consensus information, which is actually much more difficult than I thought. And really to identify areas of equipoise, areas where we don't agree or disagree on that we can study in more formal fashion. And maybe to encourage us to do um, research at a greater scale, such as developing a large uh, reservoir or registry of information that we can then pull information from to answer questions. So expert panel formation, we wanted people that had at least 10 years with a focus on the treatment of orth uh, orthopedic treatment of children with cerebral palsy and um, the motion analysis experience because we we're gonna use some of that uh, data to help make decisions. We wanted people that were from independent institutions as uh, much as we could from institutions from around the country around the, and around the world. Um, and so we ended up with 16 members with over 200 years total combined experience. Uh, they all have expertise um, and they were from different centers, at least initially. And we wanted people committed because when you get dropout, then it weakens the Delphi procedure. Once we did that, we sat down as a group and discussed what we feel the most common procedures. And we made this list. There are a number of groups looking at hip surgery and non-ambulatory children, so we didn't prioritize that. It's really the non it's really the ambulatory children and those procedures that we focused on. And then we need to format to classify indications. So indications can be based on history, physical exam, motion analysis, radiographs. Um, we even looked at outcomes. So uh, John Davids has his diagnostic matrix and we use that process to come up with um, seven class types of indications. And that was, that sort of created the format. So we had a little more structure to what we did. And then we had to um, begin the consensus process. So the first round is really a literature review and open-ended questions. You know, many of the authors wrote the papers so they had a good knowledge base. And then from that, we created an anonymous electronic survey through REDCap. 
and um, we use a Likert scaling from one to five. And that was sent out. And then people would say, I agree strongly. I agree. Uh, I'm essentially ambivalent or neutral. I disagree. I disagree strongly. And then we would collate that data. And if we had consensus, great. And if we didn't, um, the discussion, the comments, and the collated data were sent out to the group. Uh, occasionally, we would, we would then discuss that typically online, um, although the comments were all anonymous and the voting was all anonymous. And then you would repeat that process for a total of at least three times until you either came to consensus or did not. So that's how that structure works. A consensus, there are various different definitions. It usually means um, at least 75, but we use 80% of experts agree to the top two Likert scales or general um, disagreement or general consensus um, for contraindication will be 80% um, have the bottom two Likert scales. And then we use general agreement. General agreement doesn't have a defined definition, but if 60% of the people essentially agree that we call that general agreement. Uh, it's important to know that if people don't come to consensus, it doesn't mean that it's a contraindication or it's wrong. It just means there really is no consensus. And this is kind of what the feedback looked like visually. Uh, this example would be for hamstring lengthening is flex knee data indication. And this shows that 60% uh, put it in the top two scales, which would be non-consensus, but there is general agreement. And then comments were made. You don't have the names to who made the comments, but you can see that it's always very difficult um, to take the statement and apply it because it, it's, uh, you know, children are so complex. So we, we had to work through much of that and understand that. At the end of the day, um, we had a total of 377 questions. Now that's, that number is a little bit um, variable because the questions get remolded and you know what defines a question is a little less clear, but uh, we, had, we agreed or ended up with over 250 areas of consensus or general agreement, 45% uh, of the questions we came to consensus on, which I think is uh, fairly remarkable, 22% general agreement. And this has to do with all those different procedures. And then once all that information is there, we need to summarize and disseminate the consensus information. Uh, and there's still a lot of work to do with that. Uh, we do have a, a number of publications. We purposely published them in the Journal of Children's Orthopedics because it's open access. And we didn't want to limit access. Uh, this has been presented at the AACPDM as a pre-course. And then this year um, as a limited uh, course topic. And then we really need to think about how to translate this information so it's more available. Um, and also as it changes over time, because what's consensus in 2022 won't be consensus in, uh, in the future. And I, I think one of the keys then, and Uni uh, Narayan from Toronto always talks about this, identify areas of equipoise to investigate with more traditional methods. This is a, you know, it's a fine start, but it really in itself is just that. And, focusing on evidence-based research and hopefully being able to create a registry that people can commit to and, and pull information from. So uh, in summary, uh, this is the steps we went through, expert panel formation. We collated and agreed upon the most common procedures. We created and agreed to format to classify indications. We identified the most common procedures. We began the consensus process on the most common procedures and summarized and disseminated information. We still have work to do. That we're going to finish up with foot and um, ankle, and then we'll be done with this process, and we'll be looking uh, to uh, move forward with different techniques. But the goal is really to create this reservoir of expertise to shorten the learning curve for a very complex condition and prevent unneeded procedures and decrease harm. And I think that's it. So I'm going to stop sharing right now, and, and thank you very much for the opportunity to share this. Yeah, Jim, thank you very much for... For giving a beautiful uh, overview of the Delphi survey. Now, I would just like to ask, uh, what is the like the reason status? On one side, we have evidence-based uh, opinion. On the other hand, we have our expert opinion. So, where does this Delphi survey consensus stands? Well, this is um, that's a great question. I, I, you know, if you look at level of evidence, if you have expert opinion, so that could be a survey or just talking to someone, this is a formalized way of doing that on a larger scale. So, it, you know, it would be a stronger evidence than uh, classic expert opinion, which is typically one person's opinion, because you're formally identifying through iterative process 
um, things that a lot of people could agree upon. So, you know, for example, if, if you ask the question how to, it could be anything, how to fix a car, if you went to 10 resources and nine out of 10 said, this is the way to do it and don't do this, you'd feel comfortable. If you went to those resources and three experts said, do it this way, and three said, do it a different way, you'd still be confused. So I think what we've done is we've done that work for you in a rigorous ma uh, manner. And so if people can agree to it, you can feel pretty comfortable that this probably makes sense. So I, I, I think that's where the advantage is. I, I would say though, and one of my comments is, if you can do good evidence-based research, don't do Delphi. You know, if there's a way you can compare 20 very complex kids and doing 14 procedures, don't do Delphi. So when you've got a good hypothesis and a great question, that's what we need to do. And, um, and the goal of this would be, this would tell us what we don't really need to do that with, or at least that doesn't, and, and what we really do need to do the research on. Okay, so what we will do in this session is like, we will try to uh, convert this Delphi survey information into the practical uh, usable information. So we will go with uh, one scenario, the case scenario. So I will start sharing with it. So this is a session for pediatric orthopedic fellows. So uh, I'm starting with a hypothetical scenario. This is a young pediatric orthopedic surgeon uh, who has just completed his fellowship and he started a private practice in India. Uh, the practice in India is very different than that of USA uh, that you will see once you are in uh, India for our POSICON. But let me uh, give you a brief in introduction about that. He uh, saw a case with eight-year-old child, diaplegic child, GMFCS level three, walking like this. So based on the clinical examination and the video analysis, he decided that uh, he will be going for a hamstring surgery and some sort of surgery on the calf. Now, uh, like when he was a student, his mentor, he used to say this statement very commonly that, uh, gentlemen, remember that if you have a one satisfied patient, that patient will tell three other people about your success or about your good service. But on the other end, if you like uh, create a complication or if you are not able to give a good result, then that unsatisfied patient will tell 19 people. So on one side, a successful surgery will tell or will the information will be spread to only three people. But if you are not able to give a good result, then information will spread to more people. And this is very important for anyone who is in a practice. So complication can be disastrous for anyone at whatever level of practice but it's more common or more disastrous for a person who is just starting his career. So this, our friend, the pediatric orthopedic surgeon was really worried about complication. And he was trying to find out how to avoid complications. So our discussion is going to be based on that. So his main worry was, how can I avoid complication? And in search of that, he came across this article in uh, Journal of Children's Orthopedic, establishing surgical indication for hamstring lengthening and femoral derotation osteotomy in ambulatory, cerebral, uh, ambulatory children with cerebral palsy. And you are the first author of this uh, article. And so he would really like to ask you a lot of questions about how to get a good outcome following the hamstring surgery. And more important focus is how to avoid complications. So we will now continue with the questions which he will be asking. And Abhay and I will be asking those questions on his behalf. So I will stop sharing and we'll start uh, interaction. So Jim, the first question to this young pediatric orthopedic surgeon is that, what are the common complications 
following the hemsling surgery? Yeah. Well, that's a great question. Um, uh, first of all, I really like your scenario, by the way, because it is a little bit daunting. And I will say one of the most complex and difficult parts about what we're doing is applying it because it's unlikely you're just doing hamstring surgery in just about anyone. Um, one of the comments was, and there actually there's a follow-up article on hamstrings that talks about rect hamstrings transfer and so on that, that basically amplifies the same question. So it doesn't really change the um, answers too much, but essentially it said people are doing less and less hamstring surgery. But when you look at complications, um, there are different ways to look at it. One is what are the surgical complications? What are the complications you can have during surgery? And those complications um, by and large have to do with, um, you know, just skin incision, which are very uncommon. So infections, this is a very uncommon place. I've maybe had one in my life. And even that's very questionable. If you apply a cast, that's gonna be the most common place because you can get cast or skin issues. So you really need to be very comfortable with applying cast. Uh, many of these children, this child wasn't so much, but many of the children are fairly malnourished. So making sure you're an expert at applying the cast if you're gonna place a cast on afterwards. Um, and then the, the big one that people don't talk about as much is stretching of the nerve behind the knee, especially in teenagers that have hamstring lengthening, and especially if you do medial and lateral hamstring lengthening. And one of the comments was almost none of the, our expert panel did lateral hamstring lengthening anymore. It's certainly in the ambulatory kids. And the real risk is, is stretching that nerve. And we think it occurs, although no one knows for sure, after you, you lengthen the hamstring, retesting vigorously where the patient's asleep, the popliteal angle. So there's strong consensus that you should not do that. So lengthen the hamstring, um, so, so that falls in sort of the surgical related complications, things you like to avoid. They're actually pretty uncommon once you do enough of these because you avoid those. Then the other question is, well, how do you get a good result, which is a little bit different. So you, you've gone through the surgery and, you, and that has much to do with the post-op plan. And I think it's one thing we didn't talk about here, but in this case, and I think, uh, you know, boy, you can confirm that the post-op care is so important. When I worked, initially I worked at a Shrine Hospital and post-op care was easy. People came at no cost. They would stay in the hospital for two or four weeks. Uh, at Gillette, often they demand that you have six weeks in patient rehab before they'll even do the small surgery. DuPont does that. Most places don't have that luxury, but it is, the post-op care is incredibly important to getting and maximizing the results. Um, so I, I think those are the, sort of the keys to that particular surgery. Okay, so according to you, the most common complication is the sciatic now stretching uh, palsy. That's the most common. But well, uh, what? Yeah, yeah. Probably the most common significant one. Yeah, yeah. but uh, what we are really worried is about uh, the anterior pelvic tilt after sure. the hamstring surgery because probably because of the overdose of the hamstring lengthening probably that results into anterior pelvic tilt. That's one uh, complication. The second yeah. complication is about recurvatum gait, the recurvatum at the knee following hamstring surgery, yeah. because there are various reasons for that, that we will come to, uh, dis uh, we will uh, discuss those points. But these are the two important uh, complications about which we are really worried. And the yeah. third thing is like over a period of time, sometimes they redevelop the uh, hamstring contracture. So right. that's another third complications which we are worried about. I'm sure uh, in USA also, people don't like to go for a repeat surgery. The same thing in India, they, they don't like to go for a repeat surgery. So uh, like if they develop a knee flexion gait after surgery, they consider it as a failure of hamstring surgery. So no. uh, do you come across these three complications, the pelvic tilt, anterior pelvic tilt, recurvatum at the knee, and knee flexion gait even after uh, hamstring lengthening? Yeah, so great. I'll take it one by one. Um, the ex knee extension, hyperextension, I've only had one patient that has had that, and that's because we, we sort of limit our dose of hamstring lengthening. So we very rarely do lateral hamstring lengthening. Uh, there, it, in the rare case, especially if you have <clears throat> a rectus that may be spastic or even different types of tone, that can happen. And 
if you have a significant plantar flexion contracture in addition, you can end up with that plantar flexion knee extension response, excuse me. <clears throat> so I think, um, but that, in my hands, that's been very uncommon. The pelvic tilt is very common. And we actually see that in teenagers. We get longitudinal studies and we don't do the hamstring lengthening as well. And one reason why people have revisited or rethought about hamstring transfer, <coughs> excuse me, is that um, that potentially could prevent the pelvic tilt. And there's some studies, although it's very mixed, that would say that prevents um, the, hamstring, <coughs> the hamstring transfer to the bone will prevent the, um, uh, you know, prevent the pelvic tilt. So it, it's a bit mixed. I've done that occasionally. There is a move uh, and certain people that are much more committed to hamstring transfer. I think it's definitely an area for study. Okay, uh, before like uh, we go on, like Abhay, what have you seen this three complications in your practice? Um, yeah, I think the, the hyperextension gate um, is, is not too common actually because of like Dr. Um, McCarthy had said that we tend to limit the dose of uh, the hamstring uh, procedure. Uh, that's pretty much the reason why most people would not do a lateral hamstring uh, in an ambulant child. Uh, the the whole question actually come. I, I think the the decision making is is a little tricky because uh, when you commit to doing a soft tissue procedure, you are uh, deciding before you examine the child under and the anesthesia as to what dose of muscle surgery you're going to do for the amount of uh, deformity there is. Uh, so while you know something like about a, a 15, 20 degree uh, flexion deformity probably is easy enough to get with say a semitendinosus transfer or release and maybe semimembranosus with it. Um, having to add on more uh, muscle releases would, um, you know, kind of end up with an anterior pelvic tilt, uh, which is where I think, uh, you know, we would have to think very carefully about what the actual indication for doing just um, a muscle procedure is. Um, so, so in an in an older child where uh, there are other associated problems like a petal alter and things like that, the decision to do a bony surgery is is a lot uh, easier in my uh, eyes at least. I feel that you know you when uh, we do want to do a patella uh, advancement procedure, we want to have the knee absolutely straight, and so that's probably uh, the best done with uh, a bony procedure. Whereas uh, if we were to uh, try to correct a, a larger deformity with hamstring uh, procedures alone, either we end up with an incomplete correction or we would end up releasing too many muscles and have either hyperextension or an anterior pelvic tilt. So definitely those are uh, the, the known complications. But uh, I think in, in most people's practice, we are very cautious about over lengthening. And so I don't think hyperextension is something that we see very Commonly, we probably see under correction more than we see hyperextension. Okay, so uh, what Abhay said is very right that the dose is very important. And the overdose is also harmful and underdose is also equally harmful. So our discussion will be now more on like how to decide the particular dose. So let's take a first scenario. Is there any importance of age in decision making? At what age would you like to go for a hamstring surgery? Jim. That's a great question. Now, can I just comment a little bit on a few things that Mori said, which yep. are really, um, it, you know, hamstrings are not the cause of knee flexion almost ever. They're sort of a secondary occurrence. So someone's in a, uh, due to weakness, poor motor control is in crowd change. So, like in the hamstrings, if they are have increased tone might make sense, or if they're functionally short, to get them to a normal length might make sense, but it won't do anything for a knee flexion contracture. And something that the experts agreed upon is if you have a significant knee flexion contracture, hamstring lengthening, at least isolated, will not solve that at all, over 10 degrees. And I think the other point that um, I brought up was that um, you, you, we rarely ever do hamstring we really if ever do hamstring lengthening in isolation. So, um, yeah, so that, and then, um, so I just want to comment on those two things. And then we can talk a little bit about the, the dose. I think you, yeah, that was your last question. Yes. Uh, yeah. So 
for me, it's, it's much understanding what are the things you're addressing. Are you addressing a spastic hamstring, in which case you would do a fractional lengthening? Are you addressing a hamstring that is truly short? And some of the muscle modeling does help a lot with that. But the examination, the use of the hamstring shift examination um, can be helpful in determining that. Uh, and then determining if there's a knee flexion contraction, how to address that, whether it's a distal form of extension osteotomy, whether it's a hemifysiodesis, or whether um, now actually I do more and more of just extension casting. But all those options treat the knee flexion contracture, which 100% needs to be treated. Otherwise, you will get recurrence. And I, that's, that's probably the biggest thing to understand the difference between the tight hamstring and any flexion contracture. And then there's the anterior part of the knee too, which we aren't discussing necessarily today, but I think Boyd brought that up. Tele alta, extension leg, and quadricep weakness. Okay, but coming to the question of age, like uh, at what age uh, would you consider for the, the ideal age for the hamstring surgery? Yeah, uh, we, we generally look at this as part of symbols and we, we tend to look at that as probably over age six, maybe ideals around eight to 10, but um, that would be our general ideal age. Okay, and uh, do you believe the concept which uh, Freeman Miller has uh, like suggested that most of the cerebral palsy children need surgeries, two-stage surgery uh, at six to eight years, the soft tissue surgeries? and 12 years beyond the bony procedures. Do you believe in that uh, concept or you, your practice philosophy is different? I think it's different. It's probably closer to Kurograms and maybe the Gillette group where if we can, we're gonna try to do all major procedures uh, at one time in this you know, six to 10 age group. So um, we tend not to stage it. Now, I will say there's exceptions and we've had exceptions. One of the beauties of operating on someone who's very young and um, this SMPL process is that you operate on a child that's four or five, they're, gonna, they're in a steep curve of improvement. And even if you didn't do anything, they're gonna get dramatically better over the next couple of years. So there's a lot of personal satisfaction. The concern a lot of experts have is that if you do that surgery at age four, they will look great, parents will love you but you may be inflicting issues that will, you can't correct in the future, whether it's at the gastric heel cord or hamstring. So um, we in general will try to do one single, single event surgery. I will say that's the ideal. Oftentimes, and even Dr. Gage, when he's around said, there's always a little touch up surgery as they get older. So often there are some things you might do. But. Okay, uh, then another important question for the, every practitioner, that we, in the clinical examination, we give a lot of emphasis to popliteal angle. Now, how do you use that information about the popliteal angle into the decision-making? Well, I, I think it's what we measure in clinic. And so it gives you a sense, uh, depending on how you, how you do it, of hamstring, um, both spasticity, if you look at R1 and R2, and actual some element of shortness, especially if you're looking at the lumbar low dorsus and making sure that it's the true hamstring length. Uh, the, um, the few people that have looked at it have said it doesn't really correlate all that much with function. And so we had a real hard time among our experts to get consensus on how important that was. And so at the end of the day, they said, well, if it's significant, over 60 degrees, it might be one of the indications for surgery. Uh, and the Final comment, I'll just make just that everything that we're doing about indications for surgery, don't really say if you should do the surgery, because that's so much between you and the family. It's really what surgery you should do if they've decided to proceed the surgery, if that makes sense. So uh, with regards to the popliteal angle, there's something that I've kind of adopted from um, Dr. Uni's um, uh, practice. So uh, he doesn't use the popliteal angle in the traditional way that uh, it's examined with the hip uh, flex to 90 and the knee flex to 90. What his, um, his thought process is that uh, in initial contact, our hip is about 30 to 40 degrees flexed. So with the hip flex to 30 to 40, if the knee comes straight, then even if the hamstrings are spastic uh, or functionally short, they are not really uh, going to interfere with gait in the ambulant child. And so he tends to use that more 
uh, to kind of make clinical decision though of course you know it's not like like you mentioned it's not something that's done in isolation uh, but uh, the traditional popliteal angle does not i mean there are, there are papers that say it does not really correlate uh, with um, with anything yeah. essentially uh, except for the fact that if you have a large difference between your r1 and r2 there is a lot of spasticity whether that actually is going to impact gait is a completely different question uh, but this little modification that dr oni does seems to make sense uh, in the sense that if uh, we are talking about uh, a shortening of the the muscle unit per se if it is long enough to get me extension in what would be functional uh, a functional position in gait then that's that's adequate that's a great point I and mean, we were just going over that and it does make a lot of sense because it's really what you're looking at and what you care about so okay. then another important question is like when there is a fixed flexion deformity at the knee joint do you always go for the hamstring lengthening uh, before going for either the growth modulation or for going for distal femur extension osteotomy Go ahead if you want to. Do you want me to answer it or? Yeah. So my question, I, I think you understood the question that uh, uh, when there is a knee flexion deformity, before doing anything, either growth modulation or the osteotomy, do you always go for the hamstring lengthening surgery first? No, I, I'll try to combine it. So I'll try to determine if I think the hamstrings are short, if they're spastic, and or if there's a knee flexion contraction, and try to treat all three, if all three exist, even a 10 degree knee flexion contracture is, is too much. And, and what we haven't looked at as much is extension legs. So I'm trying to figure out how to add that. And we haven't, we didn't talk about that in expert consensus. So I won't bring that up, but, um, and then there's rectus spasticity, which we didn't talk much about either. But so I will look at those three things and say, they have a knee flexion contracture. And if it's within the range that's reasonable, then you can do a distal femoral extension osteotomy and you may not have to do a hamstring lengthening at all, uh, or potentially you could combine it with a medial hamstring lengthening. Uh, in my case, um, I've, I, um, I had a little different population, one that often I couldn't get long-term rehab in, um, they didn't have the same resources. And I was very nervous about doing distal femoral extension osteotomy, which really requires post-operative rehab Otherwise you can make them a lot worse. It has a pretty high, a higher complication rate. So I started doing extension casting and, and I was able to um, and get knees extended really um, pretty remarkably, much more than I thought I could. And we did publish a couple of studies on that. So I would combine that. I know I can treat a 10 to 20 knee flexion contracture almost for sure without complication in a couple of weeks. And um, if they have a contracture, I'm going to treat the contracture one way or the other. And I don't think it matters how you do it. The guided growth is a little interesting because it is an amazingly powerful technique. It's easy to put the screws in, difficult to take them out, but it doesn't happen right away. So then you, you have to ask yourself, well, how do I combine this? And in a child where I think knee flexion and, and I, you know, I think for a lot of these type threes that are more involved, that crouch gate is such a deficit. If you can't get them upright, they'll stop walking. I'm very aggressive about getting them upright. I almost would rather have them too stiff than too flex. And I think most experts agree with that. And I will do sort of full core press. I'll do um, distal femoral hemiphysitis. I'll do extension casting. And if, if the hamstrings are short, I'll lengthen them. If they're spastic, then I will um, do a fractional lengthen. So that's been our philosophy. But, um, I'm certainly open to any thoughts. Okay, now, uh, like I said, 95% of our surgeons, they don't have a facility of gait analysis, the computer gait analysis with them. Yeah. So the next question is for those orthopedic surgeons who are operating the children with cerebral palsy without the help of computer gait analysis or the 3D gait analysis. So for them, what will be your suggestions to go for the, or the indications of hamstring surgery? Yeah, it's a great question. And you know, the, even though this study, we wanted people to have a motion analysis lab and expertise in it, it wasn't meant, it, the idea was to take the concepts and then be able to apply them even if you don't have a motion analysis lab. So hopefully it would actually be helpful for those that don't. 
And you know, I think the things that people agree to that weren't direct motion analysis related, um, a de-emphasis on popliteal angle, and I think we talked a lot about that, an emphasis on um, deflection, especially at terminal stance. So if you're looking, if they don't fully extend their knee um, at terminal stance or initial contact, whichever we want to look at that, um, you know, that would be a, a potential indication as well. Um, so those were, uh, you know, we also looked at knee flexion throughout the gait cycle, it could be indication as well. So those were some of the non, um, non motion analysis things that we looked at knee pain, worsening crouch with the clinical history, knee pain, worsening crouch. Um, so that combination, again, as an adjunct to some of the other things we're doing. Okay, so now the question is, uh, do you think that computer gait analysis or the 3D gait analysis will really help us to reduce the complication rate following the hamstring surgery? Well, I, I do. I, I think there, you know, the, the technology has advanced so much that you're not going to have to have a lab pretty soon. You're going to be able to just take a video and two views and you'll get the same information. The muscle modeling has been really helpful. Uh, not as much... Um, you know, hamstring uh, velocity, but hamstring length, I think has been very helpful. Uh, being able to look at pelvic tilt, which is so difficult when they're clothed, uh, it has been very helpful because the pelvic tilt seems to be a contraindication to hamstring surgery. So I think in those cases, given our current technology and, you know, motion analysis technology is 40 years old at least, uh, it's helpful. And as soon as we can get a better system so that we can make it more applicable. I think more and more people will use it. The problem is it's just this weird technology that's very difficult to apply across the board. So, But those are key things when you're watching someone walk that you can look at and say, they really look like they have pelvic tilt. Um, this is maybe someone I should be a little careful about to answer. Now we come to the most important question and that's about the how much lengthening we should do uh, when we talk of a hamstring lengthening, it's a wide spectrum. At the extreme end, we have all the four medial and lateral hamstrings surgery. Then slightly lesser doses, like we go only for the medial hamstring lengthening. Then we come to our less dose where we go for only semi-membranosus and semi-tendinosus, the two uh, muscles we lengthen. And the last is doing only a release of semitendinosus. And even lesser than that is the transfer of uh, semitendinosus. So it's a wide spectrum. So how do you decide what dose of hamstring surgery you will give to your patient? Or do you want to, I can give you my input. I, I will tell you, we don't have con agreement or consensus among um, the group. So there's, we don't have consensus data on that. So it'd be really almost personal opinion. Um, so what are, what are your thoughts? And then I, I'm happy to chime in as well too. Yeah, so, like, so if I, yeah, if I kind of uh, have a go at that one. Um, so I kind of look at hamstrings very much like, um, um, like Prof Graham's kind of approach, which is where I did my fellowship. So he would not do anything more than the semitendinosis and maybe a, a stripe in the semimembranosis. So, in my practice, that kind of works out to about a 15 to 20 degree uh, correction. So we do uh, a semi-T transfer in isolation, you get about 10 degrees uh, correction. So it's not, I mean, of course, a gait analysis helps you uh, kind of fine tune that better, but if that's not freely available, like in, it, it is definitely a problem uh, back home where uh, we, uh, an examination anest under anesthesia gives you a better idea as to what, uh, uh, you know, quantum of deformity we're actually dealing with. So if it's up to about 20 degrees, then a semitendinosis transfer and a semimembranosis, uh, maybe, a, a, you know, fascial uh, apneurotic uh, lengthening. So that is basically what, uh, you know, Professor Graham and Paulo Selba, who were, you know, kind of the, uh, the leads at that point in time, would do so that that is probably all i would do i would not do any any more than that just because of the concern about uh, dropping the pelvis more anteriorly uh, and if if there is a deformity larger than that in a, in a younger child i would try to straighten that up with either serial casting or 
you know, Botox and some, uh, and you know, of course, all the children have the non-operative modalities tried out before they come up for surgery, of course. Uh, but if it's more than 20 degrees, I would be uh, very reluctant to do just a soft tissue procedure. And that is where if it is, if there is no other, say, petal alter or uh, if there is no asymmetry in the two knees, I would think of anterior guided growth. Um, uh, some of the, I mean, a uh, problem that I did have with slightly older children was that when the quantum of the uh, knee flexion is is different in the knees, when you put the eight plates in, you they correct at different times. And uh, you also would like to do a petal tendon advancement. You can't do it at different times. So it just doesn't work in that scenario. Uh, so it's, um, you know, so up to 20 degrees, I do soft tissue more than that. I would either do anterior guided growth or uh, something bony. That's just a personal way of, uh, that. that's what I would do. But I don't think there's any evidence to say that's better than anything else or that's the way to go. Do you do the gracilis? What do you do with the gracilis? No, just the semi That's, uh, this is, I'm molded very much by, by what, how I was trained. Um, sure. And uh, there was uh, a lot of pre and post operative gait analysis over the years uh, from the Melbourne group in their gait lab and they were following the anterior pelvic tilt very, very carefully. And even with semitendinosis transfers in isolation, there is still an anterior pelvic tilt, though not as much as when there are releases. Uh, and the, the problems are not when they are younger, it's, it's when they are young adults, when they start having back pain. And that's, that's something that as pediatric orthopods, we would have either stopped seeing them then or, you know, they are pretty much out of our radar. So, um, yeah, that's, that's basically the worry. Yep. Okay. Uh, now the next question, which is very important, and Abhay already discussed that the semi T transfer is a very popular surgery in India. So a lot of uh, pediatric orthopedic surgeons are under the influence of Paulo Salber uh, because he has been to uh, Posicon for a number of times. So a lot of people they do semi T transfer. Now when we read your Delphi survey paper. The semi-T transfer was not at all considered as a treatment option. What is the reason for that? Well, um, you know, Paulo is, is an advocate for that procedure. Um, so he's a strong advocate for that. If you look at the Delphi group, only about half of them actually did semi-tendinosis transfers. So we could only survey half the group. And of that survey, we really could come to consensus about, you know, where to transfer it, when you transfer it. But in general, the consensus was if you're someone who does it, the reason you'll think about it is if they have um, pelvic tilt, but you're still concerned about knee flexion. So the hamstring's a pretty complex muscle. It's not truly a rubber band that goes from the pelvis to the knee. It also has, you know, insertions along the lineus spare and the femur. And it's uh, and we know that a proximal lengthening is a very different than a distal lengthening. So there, there, it's a complex muscle. I don't, and then we're not really sure how great that transfer is when you wrap around the adductor uh, insertion site. It, you know, it's not bone to bone and how all that works. Uh, some of the comments were the advantage of transferring it is that, as you know, those tendons reheal pretty quickly. That work was done in sports medicine. So if you divide the semitendinosis, it's going to reheal. And if you've ever gone back and uh, had to do a redo hamstring lengthening, it's it's there. So it it's a, a fascinating subject. I'm not sure I know what the answer is, but I would say that if there is consensus, it's certainly something to think about, especially if we're worried about pelvic tilt. And you know, the interesting thing is I don't know how much a pelvic tilt has to do with natural history in that patients that are older who've never had surgery, hamstring surgery, or any type. Um, over time, when we look at serial motion analysis, develop a pelvic tilt as well. It's a little bit hard to know if, if that's iatrogenic or not, but you certainly don't want to be the one that causes that. So I, I think the reason why there isn't consensus about that is that there's just not enough information and that the studies, at least one study showed that it did potentially decrease pelvic tilt and others have shown it didn't make a difference. So in that area of equipoise, it's really hard to make a strong statement, I think. Then another popular surgery in India is a percutaneous hamstring lengthening. I'm sure some of the centers in USA are also uh, doing the same procedure. 
So yeah. what is your like uh, take on that? Is it a effective procedure or it's unreliable procedure? Yeah, uh, that's a little more of a hot topic here, um, depending on when and how you do it. So I, I've done it. I've really almost never done it in an ambulatory child. So I will say that if I'm doing multiple soft tissue releases and a child is having hip surgery and the hamstrings are tight, I may do so. Um, that, that surgery in particular, the SMPL was heralded by a, you know, Dr. Nuzo, New Jersey. Uh, and it was really not well established in the scientific literature. So it, it became very popular among patients who would travel long distances for this procedure. And, and many of the experts, um, including people I really respect, experts that have children with cerebral palsy uh, are uh, not a, do not consider that to be a, a, a good procedure to do. And I, I would say I've not, um, you know, I may not be as strongly opinionated, but we are gonna actually probably proceed with a Delphi to, to ask those very questions because it is very controversial. And the concern is because there's such a strong internet presence for that, but not a scientific evidence for it, that patients are getting corralled at a young age for the surgery that may have negative long-term repercussions. So that would be the concern. Okay, uh, then coming to the post-operative treatment, uh, do you suggest SLR uh, to stretch the hamstring post-operatively, straight leg raising uh, exercise? So the, the post-op routine I think is really important and I probably have a more aggressive, if you can get an environment like you have where people can come back for aggressive, either inpatient or therapy on a daily basis for several weeks, it is incredibly beneficial. But realistically, that is so difficult to have. So um, I, I really want the knees to be fully straight and then I maintain them. I'm a big believer in nighttime splinting. The data on that is not very strong, but what's out there is pretty encouraging. So once I get the knees straight, I will do whatever I can to maintain the muscle length. There's some really interesting basic science research done by my partner, Roger Cornwall, looking at muscle fiber length and how it compares in brachial plexus and CP. And I think keeping the muscles long is really important. So afterwards, nighttime immobilization and stretching, I think is really important to maintain. And that's, that's the big difference I've seen. The recurrence rate for hamstring lengthening at three years should be as much as 50%. If you're really aggressive, you can keep that number down. And I think that's the biggest complication when you look at complications. Okay. Uh, then uh, one of the concern is like, uh, once we do a hamstring lengthening, we give a cast to immobilize the knee joint. The knee is in a full extension. Now, if we allow the patient to sit, um, in that case, the hip will be in a 90 degree position. So hamstring is stretched to a maximum length because hip is 90 degree and the knee is extended. So do you recommend uh, your patients to sit after hamstring lengthening surgery? Yeah, that, that's a really insightful question. Um, it, it, my, question, my answer would be, if they, if, especially if they're older and they have a, a true hamstring contraction that's very significant, these are largely marginally ambulatory children, you're afraid if you don't do anything, they'll stop walking. Um, those are children that I'm very careful about the hip position. I don't want to stretch their sac nerve and I also don't want to overstretch the hamstrings. Um, they are typically though children with such dramatic contractures that they need that I'm really not worried about over lengthening the hamstrings. And again, that's such an uncommon situation for me. I'm much more worried about nerve than I am about the hamstrings, but. Um, yeah. Okay, and uh, like both hamstrings and quadricep, they are uh, working in synergy. So do you do anything specially for the quadricep strength or the length following the hamstring surgery? Uh, I occasionally, and I'm a little bit of a convert. So, and there is a, I think a paper that's out of coming out about if they have a spastic rectus, not spastic quad, that lengthening or transferring it, the disadvantage of transfer is you cannot put them in a cast afterwards, otherwise the transfer will largely be useless. So just striping or lengthening the rectus for Morris, which uh, Kristen Perez does, I think really makes sense in spastic children with cerebral palsy. And I do it occasionally, and I'll probably start doing that a little bit more. 
would you be basing that decision on uh, the kinematics or is it something that's more on um, clinical exam it would be ideally it would be on a combination of kinematics so decreased peak knee flexion combined with emg that shows increase um, um, out of phase activity in that muscle group Yes, that, that's, I think the, 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 the advantage of having kinematics and kinetics is being able to fine tune the, those procedures of adding on something in the rectus and, and maybe even, um, you know, any, and, and then, but, but the, the, I think what um, Dhirinbhai was trying to get at is, uh, is post-operatively, oh, is that what you were uh, asking? Is it post-op quadriceps rehab as well? along yes. with is that that would probably be part of most of the post operative rehab because getting them up and walking would in entail getting the quadriceps stronger and, and working on it and the eli duncan test i think is a pretty powerful test to measure right this one I, I would also we, we are big advocates of neuromuscular electro stimulation it's actually not a very expensive addition patients can take it with them at home we're just trying to figure out the best use for it but there's some really interesting work coming down do with lower spinal or actual muscle um, and MES. So hopefully that'll be a new tool we can use and aid in rehabilitation, both pre-op and even non-surgical. Okay, uh, like we don't want uh, that our patient should develop a post-operative anterior pelvic tilt, but because of the overdose or because of some other reason, if patient develop increased anterior pelvic tilt after surgery, how do you manage that? Um, well, if you've got a good way, uh, you know, um, so I would say I don't have a good way. Uh, hip extension exercises and then um, anterior, um, you know, either tummy time or stretching the hip flexors as much as possible. But I don't, I honestly don't have a good way of treating that. Uh, there are osteotomies and I've talked to Tom Novacek and he said, you can do extension osteotomies as a femur. That seems like uh, a, a pretty um, extensive procedure, but um, those are the only things that I've, I've not done it, so. No, but like say, if, if someone develops, then what will be your suggestions to overcome that uh, problem? I've not had it be a problem that was clinic, I, you could see it clinically, but I've not had a problem that's affected them clinically. So I've not done that, but that would probably be my suggestion. Other, you know, I'd start with therapy, fix extension exercises, work on hip flexion, flexor uh, stretching and range of motion. And if all that didn't work and you're really in difficult times, I do extension osteotomies. And boy, I don't know if you have any thoughts, I'd love to hear them. Uh, well, I, I think the, the, the bottom line is there is no, no good uh, solution, which is why everybody's so cautious about overdoing the hamstrings. And, um, and, and usually the, the anterior pelvic tilt is more evident when they walk as an exaggerated lumbar lordosis. Uh, and it's it it is at least in the early stages probably more cosmetic than it is a functional issue, uh, but yeah, probably not a good place to be at. And I, I don't think there's really anything in the literature that tells us which way to go. Okay, and so we are like at the end of the session. So last question: What do you see the future of hamstring surgery? How the things will go? Um, if you want, I, I think we will be doing less of it. I think um, we'll be doing lesser doses of it. And I, I think there probably is some role for transfer uh, in the future. It's just figuring out when to do uh, those different options. Okay, I think like so you had mentioned uh, earlier, it's, it's more than just a connection between the hip and the knee. The, the hamstrings do a lot more than that and, and probably figuring out what um, the each of those muscles does at the hip and the knee uh, and how it kind of involve, how it affects the, the gait impairment would be key to then fine tuning uh, uh, surgery. So you know, I think the, that's an open space. Yeah, great space. Yeah, so uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor McCarthy and Abhay for sharing your views on hamstring surgery. It, it's a very easy surgery, but uh, the side effects or the overdosing of that surgery can lead to a significant uh, problem for the patient. So it's very important that we avoid uh, this complication. And that was the whole aim of this uh, discussion. So thank you very much once again for joining us. 
and uh, we request you to join for the future session also so we can discuss more on the various difficult questions related to cerebral palsy so thank you. thank you i learned a lot thank, thank you really yeah, thank awesome. you thank you yeah cheers thank you yeah see you bye-bye